good day to be in the house of the Lord. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else today, I'll tell you that. Amen. What a privilege to come into his house and not only keep the Sabbath like we do every single week, but to honor what made all of this possible on this holy day. You know, sometimes we just forget that holiday is really holy day. That's where it came from. And today is nothing short of the holiest of holy days. And I am grateful that I can celebrate a risen Savior, that I can celebrate a God who is alive and well. As a matter of fact, he's not even sick. Not even tired. Not even sleeping today, but he's alive and well. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so today I've come to preach a message entitled, A Matter of Hope and Fear. Last week I preached a a message that I entitled, whether I gave you the title or not, I don't know, but uh, the message was entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. If you're watching online, you might want to look up the Palm Sunday message entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. But today, I'm going to preach to you for a little bit about hope, because there is hope in Jesus Christ. And I'm here as a walking, living, breathing testimony that my life has hope because I know Him. Let's go to Psalm 147 and verse 11. Psalm 147 and verse 11 says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear Him, in those that hope in His mercy. Now, it's really important that we understand the context of fearing God. Many people just look at that phrase, to fear the Lord, and look at that word fear, and they think that it means to be afraid of God. Look, if that's what works for you, then there's nothing that is bad if it brings you to a place of knowing that you need a Savior in your life. But I want to tell you that to fear the Lord, here's how we explain it around here, F-E-A. Are. It's faith exercised as reverence. When you fear the Lord, what it means is that you reverence Him with everything that you have, with everything that you think, with everything that you are. You fear the Lord. And today I want to tell you that people are walking away from the fear of God. But in doing so, there is a price to be paid. The Scripture said that He takes pleasure in them that fear Him, and in those that hope in His mercy. Today, people are looking for hope in all kinds of different places. People are looking for hope in their philosophical leanings, in their uh, different ways that they try to explain how they got here in the first place. Can I tell you, people are walking away from the fact that God made you and that without His hand in your life, you wouldn't have a life. As a matter of fact, the Bible puts it this way way. It says in him all things consist. You know what I've come to tell you today? Not only did he make you, not only did he create you, but this very moment he is literally holding together every atom that makes up the tissues in your body. Literally. Scientists still can't figure out what it is that holds the electrons and the neutrons and, and, and all of the various particles together. I, I know who holds it together. His name is Jesus, and he's holding it together right now. He's holding you together right now. It's ridiculous to walk away from the fear of the Lord. It is delusional to walk away from the fear of God. Look, just because you pretend God doesn't exist doesn't mean he's not real. And so he takes pleasure and he delights in those that fear him, but also those that hope in his mercy. Now, I looked up some research on hope. And coming from 
a cancer treatment background in the medical field for many years, I already was very well aware that when folks have hope, they can survive. But when hope is taken away, whether it's from an infant, whether it's from an elderly individual or anybody in between, when hope is present, life can exist. And I knew that to be true already, but there was a study that was done and it it uh, spanned over decades of time, 30 years of studying individuals in this area of hope. And they found, I'll just abbreviate this, this was done at the Boston University's School of Medicine as well as National Center for PTSD at Boston and Harvard University. And here's what they found. They found that when hope was present in the lives of these individuals, that they were between 50 and 70 percent more likely to reach the, the, the age of 85. 50 to 70 percent more likely to reach the age of 85 and to live uh, to a longer lifespan. So we know that even, even the scientists have to admit that hope when it is in existent in somebody's life, it literally causes you to keep living. Literally keeps you living. Well, <laughs> I didn't need a study to tell me because the Word of God puts it this way. Proverbs 10 and 27 says this. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. I just need to read it again. I know this is Easter Sunday, but I'm just going to go ahead and read it again. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. God is calling upon those that will say, I'm not afraid of man. I'm not afraid of what this world can do. I'm not afraid of what tomorrow is going to bring. But I have a fear of God. And I know in whom I have believed. He's the one that put the stars in the sky. He's the one that said, let there be light. And he's the one that called my life into existence existence. I'm thankful today that I know a God that is bigger than everything, that's bigger than anything. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is everything today, and I've come to preach to you about Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But look at the other side of the equation here. It says, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Yes, uh-oh, indeed. To understand this scripture, we need to really understand what wickedness means. Because like it or not, God put you in this moment. Like it or not, God put you in this generation. And what do we have to deal with in ministry in this generation? We have wickedness that is on the increase in this world. Why was the world destroyed in the flood? Because God looked down and he saw that every man was doing what he thought was right in his own eyes. And the word of God says this. He looked on the wickedness of man and he said, I'm going to go ahead and, and clean all of that up. And so he destroyed the world. And you know the story. Well, today we've got to understand that wickedness is coming back and that there's going to be a consequence one more time to this world. But in order to understand that, we need to know what wickedness is. It's very simple. Scripturally defined, wickedness is simply not, not this evil thing. You don't have to be a mass murderer to be wicked. You don't have to rob a bank to be wicked. Matter of fact, you don't even have to be a mean, ugly person to be wicked. But wickedness, scripturally speaking, is simply doing what is right in your own eyes. I came to tell you that Jesus made a way and that Jesus came to show us the way. He is the life. He is the truth. He is everything that we need. But today, man is trying to stand up and outshout the gospel of Jesus Christ and trying to lift up their own their self-righteousness rather than the righteousness of God. 
The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs. It says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I came to tell you, your way will not get it done. I want to tell you today that your way is not going to get you to heaven. Your way is not even going to bring you hope in this life. But there is a way, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's here today, and he's alive. He came up out of that tomb, and the grave is empty. How do I know? I've been there. I walked into the grave, and I know that Jesus is alive. I know he's alive. You'll never convince me otherwise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Billy Graham, I believe, was the one that said, when asked, how do you know that he's alive? He said, well, I talked to him this morning. Can I tell somebody today? I spoke in tongues this morning, and I spoke in tongues again when I got in the car, and then I got in the prayer room, and I began to speak in tongues one more time because the Holy Ghost has filled me up to overflowing. And I feel his presence right now. I don't have to look back to this morning when I talk to him. I feel him right now. Oh, he's walking up and down these aisles in this place today. He's calling your name. You that are watching online, he's calling your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching about a matter of hope and fear. So the word says that there are two outcomes here. The fear of the Lord prolongs days. Wickedness, not so much. Look at the next verse. It says, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. So, Whatever it is that you're putting your hope in, whether it's your politics, whether it's some kind of social justice agenda that you have bought into, whether it's some kind of individual in your family that you have faith in, there's only one possible outcome when you put your faith in man. They're going to let you down. I don't care if it's your husband, your wife, your mother, your grandparents, whoever it is, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher. I want to tell you that when you trust in man, you're going to be let down. You're going to be sorely disappointed because man can't do what Jesus has already done for you. But you can put your faith in Jesus because he will never let you down. He will never allow you to just walk alone. He said, even to the end of the earth, I'm with you. Even to the end of the earth, I'm going to be with you. Even David put it this way. He said, if I walk right on into hell, I'm going to find him there. If I go up into the skies, I'm going to find him there. You can't get away from him. He's with you. And if you trust him, you're going to have hope that it will take you beyond anything this world can dish out. You say, Pastor, you don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know the sickness that I've had to deal with. You don't know the impossibilities that I've faced. Oh, maybe I don't. But I know a risen Savior who's made a way for you. He's healed your body already. He's made a way for you where there was no way already. I came to tell somebody that you can trust him. He'll never let you down. He's the one that has every answer for you. He's the one with healing in his hand. He's the one that has everything that you need today. There's nobody like him. There's nothing that you can ever find that compares to him. His name is Jesus. I came to preach him and him crucified from this pulpit in this church, in this day. I came to tell you, he's everything. He's everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're talking about lifespan here and how that the fear of God and hoping in his mercy will literally add years to your life. Look at... uh, Proverbs, the 11th chapter and verse 7. Here's what it says about the other side. It says, when a wicked man, uh, uh, when a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish and the hope of unjust men perisheth. So 
Now, if the Bible was right about hope extending your lifespan, and, you know, I don't know why we think that way, that we have to back it up with science to make us believe it. No, I believe it whether scientists have come to understand it or not. I know that Jesus is the truth. But today I want to tell you that there is a price for walking away from the fear of God and embracing wickedness. Did you know I looked up a few statistics today? I'll just give you a couple of them. They were startling. I began to look at the number of people in Christianity that still claim that they believe in the resurrection, that still claim that they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to go there in just a moment and and show you some scriptures about that. But it was so startling. Do you know that even those that claim that they believe that Jesus rose again on the third day, uh, it it was staggering to discover that 75% of all of Christianity Christianity believes you can work your way to salvation. That you can be a good enough person to get there. That you can do enough good works that will get you in the door. I came to talk to somebody. Maybe it's not somebody in this congregation, but but I came under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to tell somebody it doesn't matter how good you think you are. It won't get the job done because neither is there salvation in any other. But there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be, you must be saved. Jesus said you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. Oh, but I came to tell you he's still saving. He's still delivering. He's still bringing people to the foot of the cross today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have hope in this world because of Jesus. He's my hope. He's my hope. No matter what comes along, no matter what situation that I can't get myself out of, I have hope in Jesus because he is my counselor. He is my mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. Oh, he's the best friend that I've ever had. He's everything to me and I know him for myself. Oh, I was told about him when I was just a kid, but you know what? It didn't compare to what I felt and experienced when I knelt down and said, Jesus, I want to know you for myself. Come into my heart. All the Sunday school lessons in all the world couldn't compare or describe what happened in that moment. My life was changed. All the sin that I had in me, even as a child. You think kids don't know how to sin? Do they, Justin? Yeah, one of your first words was no, wasn't it? David said we're born in sin, shaping in iniquity. (laughs) But Jesus' blood took care of it. In that moment, all my sins were eradicated. The word of God said that he will cast your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. They'll, They'll be as far away as the east is from the west. Is anybody grateful that your sins have been washed away? Is there anybody thankful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all of our sin today? Hallelujah. So, you see, trying to get it done your own way and in your own abilities and raising yourself up into a place where you can accomplish righteousness, that is precisely what is happening even inside of the church. Let me finish my statistics. (laughs) You see, I found that even, uh, I told you, 75% of Christianity still believes that, you know, somehow that you can work your way into heaven and, and into salvation, something folks believe in something called collective salvation. That means somebody else collectively can do something good enough and and you'll just sort of, I guess by osmosis, just get pulled right on into the vortex of salvation whether you want it or not. No, I came to tell you that every man, every woman, and every child is going to have to make a decision. What will you do with the sacrifice that Jesus made for you? Every one of us 
will have to make a decision. I'm glad my choice has been made. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to serve the Lord. Oh, but, but so today, uh, I, I found that staggering. But I found even more surprising that among Pentecostal Christians, 50% responded that they thought that works could accomplish salvation. I'm telling you, pastors have stopped preaching the truth from the pulpits today. And they have started preaching messages that they think are going to cause people to continue to come. Look, the Bible says this, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, because there's coming a time when they won't hear what the word of God has to say. Oh, look, I'm going to preach the word of God with every breath that I have in this body until Jesus takes me out of here one way or another, because it's the truth that is going to get you to heaven. Oh, look, you can sugarcoat it all you want, but there's one way to make it to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. I am the way. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm glad that I know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go with me to Romans, the 10th chapter and the third verse. We're going to read a few scriptures here in Romans. Actually, I'm sorry, let's back up to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and then we'll go to Romans. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. How many are willing to say, I'm standing in the gospel of Jesus Christ? You won't change my mind about it. I know too much about him. I can't ever doubt him. Hallelujah. And so that's what Paul said, in, in which you stand. The next verse says, by which ye also are saved. How many know you're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It was prophesied that that would happen, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Go to verse 14. So we see here that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are all essential aspects of the gospel that Paul preached that is necessary for your salvation. Verse 14 said, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain. And your faith is also vain. If he wasn't risen from the grave, then anything that you wanted to say about his death and his sacrifice would be in vain. Take a look at verse 17. It says again, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. And you are yet in your sins. You wonder why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this Sunday. It's because it means everything. It means everything. Because on that moment, in that moment, on, on that day, when he raised that temple up, he said this. He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And in that moment, he took, he took the, 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 the keys away from the enemy. To death, hell, and the grave. And you know what? Because of that, hope began to spring eternal for those of us who were lost in sin and shaping in iniquity. And because Jesus came up out of the grave, I want to tell you that there's not just one empty grave, but there were others that came forth when Jesus came up. There were other saints that came up out of the grave. And I want to tell you that I'm a living witness. There's an empty grave with Doug Clanton written all over it because of what God has 
has done for my life and in my heart. And I know that he's given me salvation. It's not just one empty grave that we have to celebrate today. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell somebody today, he's alive because he lives inside of me. And I've got a world to tell about what he's done. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation. Glory to God. Well, it doesn't stop there. Look at this verse. It says that then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ would just be perished uh, forever without the resurrection. But verse 19 says, if in this life only you have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most miserable. So I came to tell you that in this life, if you have hope in Jesus, that we have the promise uh, when we fear the Lord that our life is going to be extended and that we're going to have long life. Oh, but look, that might sound like something really great, except when you put it up against eternity that is going to go on forever without end. And I came to tell somebody and to testify according to the word of God that you are a living eternal soul. You have some flesh that you're walking around in. And that's temporary. But inside of you is a soul that is going to go on forever. It's going to live somewhere for eternity. I, you know, there was a church family that was here and used to come. And, and one of the ladies brought her daughter. And she was a young adult. And somebody I thought was raised in the church. And I preached a very simple message that day. I don't know if it was Easter or what it was. But I just asked a very simple question. I just asked, where are you going to spend eternity? Talk about PTSD. I mean, that girl went home and her life was just wrecked because I asked a simple question to a a, a young woman in a Christian family. Where are you going to spend eternity? Look, if you don't know... (laughs) that we need to get something fixed in your life today. If you're not sure what's going to happen when you lay this body down one way or the other, then we've got an answer for you. But you ought to know beyond any shadow of doubt what's going to happen to you should you, you know, we don't have the promise of tomorrow. We don't like to talk about that, but it's a fact. You might walk out of this place and you might not make it back to another service. It happens. It has happened. Even in this church, it's happened. But I want to tell you that there's a hope in Jesus that if it's tomorrow, if it's today, if it's next week, or if it's 70 years from now, I know in whom I have believed. I know where I'm going. I know that I have eternal life. Oh, I'm thankful today for the hope that I have in Jesus. And Paul said that, that if you have hope only in this world, well, it's, it's great to have hope in this world, in Christ. He's my healer. He's, he's everything that I need. Oh, but it goes far beyond this vapor of an existence. That's what James put, said about it. That's what the Word says about it. Even in the book of Psalms, it says this life is just a vapor of existence. But I know what's going on after that vapor is over and done. I want to tell somebody today that I've got hope that goes beyond beyond this life, beyond this life, because it's everlasting life. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm glad that I don't have hope just in this life and this existence. Look at verse 20. It says that but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Do you know what that means? It means that he was the first one resurrected, but he won't be the last one. Hallelujah. Because one of these days, we're going to hear a trumpet sound. Whether you go in death first or whether you're still alive and remain, he's coming back. And we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And we're going to be with him. We're going to see him face to face. Hallelujah. I want to show you what the word says about it in verse 51. Just a few more verses here. 
and then we'll go into Romans. Here is what it says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Oh, is it going to take very long for it to happen? No. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. For this corruptible, hallelujah, I'm getting excited. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Oh, I'm looking forward to that moment. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. It's going to happen, church. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory hallelujah oh he's triumphant today because he got up out of the grave he took the keys of death of hell of the grave I want to tell you one of these days I'm going to watch as he says Jane come forth and I'm going to see her rise up one more time. I'm going to see her in a brand new body. I'm going to see those that we've said goodbye to, our loved ones, and all those that we have mourned. They're passing. I want to tell you, because of Jesus, we didn't say goodbye for the last time. Because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, they're going to rise again. They're going to rise again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? I want to tell you that when I see Barbara Gordon raise up from the dead because she was washed in the blood, you know what? I'm going to say, death, you didn't get the final word. Death, you are conquered because of the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, what a reunion it's going to be. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, what a, a homecoming it's going to be when all the saints of God that are ready to hear his voice come up out of the grave. The word says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hallelujah. Take a look at Romans, the 10th chapter. In the third verse, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, I have to admit, this is one of the scriptures that God recently put in my Bible And I truly feel like I've never seen this before the last few weeks. Because if there was ever a scripture that succinctly sums up what we're seeing in the last days. Inside the church, outside of the church, we are seeing people who are raising themselves up in their own self-righteousness and letting go of the righteousness of God. Oh, but if you want to go when the trumpet sounds, here's what the the book of Matthew said about it in 6 and 33 it says but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness not your righteousness not the righteousness of whoever it is that you're putting your hope in and your faith in I don't care if it's the president of the United States I don't care if it's the Pope I don't care who it is that you think is going to get it done for you oh look there's only hope in one and his name is Jesus Christ and he's the one that died for you he He's the one that made a way for you. And it's his righteousness that we have to seek first, according to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Hallelujah. Verse four says this, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Verse nine puts it this way. 
in the same chapter, verse 9 of chapter 10 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I came with some good news for somebody that isn't quite sure what might be happening when your life is at an end. You can know. You can know. You can have an assurance in Jesus. Oh, you've got to confess him with your mouth. And you've got to call upon his name. Hallelujah. Look at this verse. The next verse says this. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says this. I love it. It says, for whosoever. Would you just say that word with me? Whosoever. Is there anybody that falls into that category today? Would you raise your hand if you're a whosoever? Oh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't care who told you that it's not for you. I don't care who tried to exclude you from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's for whosoever I came to preach the word of God to every individual under the sound of my voice whosoever I don't care if your body doesn't match who you feel like you are on the inside I don't care if you've been put into a body that has different challenges you're a whosoever I don't care if your family has turned their back on you and told you you're not good for anything I don't care if you're a prostitute or a drug addict or what it is that's going on in your life today you're a whosoever and this is the word of God that I have to declare it's the gospel of Jesus Christ whosoever whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved oh he loves you more than anybody could ever love you he loves you more than you'll ever comprehend and he shed his blood for your salvation Hallelujah. I want to ask you to stand all over this building today on this Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. I feel a strong anointing that is going forth for those that are watching online. I feel a strong anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you don't know what you're feeling, let me tell you that that's God. And He is drawing you this moment to be near Him and close to Him. The Word of God said, except that Spirit draws you, you can't come to the Lord. And He's drawing you right now by the power of His Spirit. And so I'm going to ask everybody, would you take the hand of the person next to you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now look, I look across this congregation and I've pastored most of you for many years. And I know how many times you've said the sinner's prayer because I've been there. Some of you for the first time, most of you, you've said it at Christmas and on Easter. But I don't know who's watching me online right now. And God has an appointment that was set up for you today. And he drew you to this moment. And if you will receive the Lord into your heart and call upon the name above every name, his name is Jesus. I just read to you the scripture. It says that you shall be saved. You won't ever have to wonder what's going to happen for you throughout eternity ever again. You can put your head down on the pillow and know that if the Lord were to call you in the night, that you would still have everlasting life. Hallelujah. That's worth more than all the money that you could ever come up with in this whole world. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to ask you, some of you for the 30th, 40th time, but maybe somebody for the first time. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, and I'm going to ask you to repeat the words that I speak after me. But it's very important that you make these words and this prayer your own. 
and pray these words from your heart. The word said that you have to believe in your heart and speak with your mouth. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me and repeat these words. Jesus, I know you're real. And I feel you right now. And Lord, I ask you to cleanse me of all of my sin. Forgive me for every sin I've committed. Thank you for your blood that washes me clean. Come into my heart and save me. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. Because you're the only way to be saved. Thank you for your promise. I give my life to you. And I thank you for your promise. And I confess with my mouth that my sins are washed away. I confess with my mouth that I have eternal life. And that Jesus is alive today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Somebody clap your hands if you know he's real. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise team, come on up. Hallelujah. Sunday the grave could conceal him no longer that day when the stone it was rolled 